Welcome to this edition of When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine, a discussion of sustainable bu- <laughs> dis- <laughs> sustainable living and what that means to you and me. I'm Jay Warmke. And I'm Annie Warmke. <laughs> All right. And today we're going to try to talk about fuel cells or it's the technology of the future and it always will be. So. You know what? I think the reason you stumbled is you. it sounded like you started to say we're in the bubble. We're in the bubble. It feels like that sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, we're in the remote bubble. So we're going to talk about fuel cells a little bit here. And fuel cells is one of those technologies that, that, geeks love you know well you uh, should be like right. fantastically happy then. okay well i'm gonna have to turn my geek badge in because i'm not that much in love with it so <laughs> and and well fu- isn't it true that fuel cells are like tomorrow and then tomorrow again and 40 tomorrow. years later or tomorrow tomorrow again and lots of money invested and yeah and yet nothing to really show for it well that's what i mean when i say it's the technology of the future and always will be if you look at some of the literature um, in fact, I, I was going to save this for last, but I think the quotes are kind of interesting. Um, when you look at some of the quotes through the ages, it says, for instance, in 1960 in a magazine, there was a quote that said, the question about fuel cells is not whether they'll work, but when they'll be ready to use. We're very close now. Now, this is always the, saying that, right though. in 1960. And then 1997, after decades of unfulfilled promises, fuel cell momentum is now so great that its emergence as a prominent technology appears just short of inevitable. I think that translates it translates into we have had a heck of a lobby cost <laughs> this year. Well, and, and just last just in July of 2020. Uh, The Economist just published, after many false starts, hydrogen power might now just bear fruit. And and of course, we'll end with a quote from uh, Elon Musk of Tesla. He says, fuel cells are mind-bogglingly stupid. Yeah, okay. I just still like to see what the <laughs> lobbying price tag well, is for and, all And we'll talk a little bit about that, but fuel cell technology is not new. I mean, fuel cell technology has been around really since William Grove invented it back in 1839. And he did a lot of experiments with gas, voltaic batteries, and he basically found out that he could create an electrochemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. But you had to do it over a platinum catalyst. So even from the very beginning, this was a pretty expensive technology. And in 1889, Charles Langer, he created one using coal gas. They always like to call it coal gas. It's basically natural gas. And uh, that's how he got his hydrogen. But it really wasn't until around 1959 that um, a fellow named Frank Francis Bacon, right? Francis Bacon, uh, not the Francis Bacon from the 16th century. I was just going to say, wait, wasn't yeah. he like a famous guy before? He was a famous philosopher. He's the one who said knowledge is power. And he had another interesting quote. It was something like, some books are meant to be consumed, some are meant to be um, swallowed, and some are meant to be chewed on and digested, you know? So (laughs) I don't know, no wonder. Uh, Anyway, so later his namesake invented the fuel cell. And um, then around the same time, uh, another scientist was working and he took that fuel cell, the bacon fuel cell, and actually attached it to an Alice Chalmers tractor, something you'd be familiar with, right? No, Uh, I I was always a Ford woman. Ford? Not even John Deere, huh? No. Okay, so, (laughs) (laughs) all right. So anyway, um, they then created this uh, tractor that ran on fuel cells, which was pretty cool. It would have been around the early 1960s. And then the Air Force got involved, and they created like a forklift with fuel cells and a golf cart and even a submersible vehicle. They just call it a submersible. I don't know if they drove the golf cart into a lake or something, but anyway, it was submersible. It said vessel. Vessel. Well, it's (laughs) a vehicle. I don't think a vehicle implies on land. Well, that could be a cup. That's right. (laughs) It's a couple or a a miniature thing. Right. So anyway, um, it kind of evolved into just something that was being used in uh, NASA. I mean, NASA was using fuel cells. They found that they worked nicely in Apollo spacecraft. They used them all the way up until uh, the space shuttle. I was going to say, but don't they blow people up? No, no. Fuel cells are pretty, um, they're pretty 
robust. Um, the nice thing about a fuel cell and why it works well in space is, first off, cost is no object. You know, I mean, they can spend whatever they want to. But the off-putting of a fuel cell, if you have hydrogen and you have oxygen, then the uh, waste products are going to be pure water and heat. And that's exactly what they needed in, in the spaceship. So they use them for heating. Yeah, they but use... isn't it combustible? No. no. Well, hydrogen is, but but it's it's only if it leaks and if you get a, a you know a, a spark of some sort. But I mean, the rocket fuel is pretty combustible. Um, <laughs> that's know. what I was thinking. Yeah, that's the a, two together. Well, I think they do. Somewhere. I think they do use liquid hydrogen as the rocket fuel. If wow. I'm not mistaken, I I might be wrong. But so so that's kind of where everything stood with fuel cells, uh, really up until the 1990s, and then the uh, California. Air Resources Board, um, affectionately known as CARB, very anti Atkins, uh, introduced <laughs> <Or> keto. <laughs> right, introduced a zero emissions vehicle um, plan. So really, what they were looking at is how do we get the emissions from our vehicles down to zero? And it was really electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles that that met this. So of course they put in some some legislation that had some teeth in it. So all these car manufacturers started running out and um, trying to uh, invest some money. There was a lot of government money, like you alluded to earlier, where the government would step in. And the government stepped in and said, let's build like an infrastructure, the, the hydrogen highway. They, they love to talk about things like that. And so they started really investing. And it was really driven by California. So they built some hydrogen buses and buses were always seen as a good option because hydrogen fuel cells are very heavy. I mean, super heavy. Wait, and what does that mean? I don't Heavy, understand. like picking them up. You can't pick them up. Oh. They're just heavy. <laughs> and, oh, uh, the weight. Of yeah. That. And so they're not really practical for a car per se, because the weight versus, I mean, it takes a lot of energy to move that weight. Right. But a bus has that advantage. First off, it's already big. But secondly, it drives a set route. So you could set up your fueling stations at periodic stops and refuel it along the way. And you don't have to search all over creation for a fueling station, which points out another problem. Because even with the hydrogen fueling stations that they started building on in California, they really as uh, they only have about 39 fueling stations in California, in California. And there are only maybe a half dozen in the rest of the country. Wow. So, and, and compare that to in California, there are 10,266 regular gas stations. So 39, 10,000, 10,000 is more by the way. So trying to find a place to refuel can be difficult. And if you think about the United States as a whole, we have about 168,000 gas stations. We have about 45 hydrogen fuel stations. And they ran into a problem in 2019 because still there were people who were buying these cars. Okay, I'll back up a little bit because some manufacturers decided to sell fuel cell cars. I've seen, I've seen them. You know, they, they, people that own them are just giddy about it. Yeah, at first. I think. <laughs> Until they run out of petrol. Well, yeah, or <laughs> hydrogen. I mean hydrogen. Well, the Toyota um, Mirai, M-I-R-A-I, that's probably the best selling one. Uh, it costs around $58,000 for this car. Uh, they've sold about 5,000 of them since 2015. There's also the Honda Clarity and the Hyundai Nexo. I think those are pretty much the only the three. But you consider if you look at Toyota, they sold 5,000 over five years, whereas Tesla, for example, sold 367,000 electric vehicles in 2019. So when you're comparing the two, one of the problems with fuel cells and why it's always the technology of the future and always will be is really it has to be compared to the availability of electric or battery based technology. And the battery-based technology always seems to be leapfrogging ahead of what the fuel cell technology, fuel cell technology is doing. So anyway, to get back to some of the supply problems, 
Um, back in 2019, one of these hydrogen plants in Sa Santa Clara blew up, you know, like you said. It's, That's what I'm it's always combustible. thinking about. Like when I see a bus driving and I think I wouldn't ride on that bus. I'd be afraid somebody rear ended it and we'd all go to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can do that in any car. You know? <laughs> I know it, but I don't really want to be the one that's right. there. I'll, I'll, somebody else can do that. So anyway, so after this supply station blew up, then these fuel cell stations didn't have any any fuel um, for a long time. So here you are, you own this fuel cell vehicle and you can't refuel it. Um, so the state of California actually invested $120 million wow. in these fueling stations. And they ended up with 39 of them. I mean, that's, I don't But know. my question is, doesn't fuel, doesn't hydrogen leak? Yeah, well, so hydrogen. It's not like it stays in the vessel or the vehicle. It's going to be leaking out over time, like an evaporation or something. Yeah, that's one of the really hard things with hydrogen. Of course, hydrogen is the smallest atom in, in the universe, I guess, as far as we know. And uh, if you've ever had like a, a helium balloon, helium is a bigger atom than hydrogen even. And if you ever had it in like a regular rubber balloon, after a couple of hours or days, it all leaks through. It leaks through that rubber. That's oh. why they put them in the mylar. It, that keeps the helium inside because okay. it'll go right through rubber. Well, hydrogen is so small, it'll go right through metal tanks. It will eventually leach out. So they really only have a couple of options is to cryogenically freeze it to make it super, super oh, frozen okay. and do. compressed. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of energy required in getting this hydrogen and compressing it down, uh, storing it, freezing it. And then, of course, you've got the problem of these vehicles driving around with this compressed explosive hydrogen in a little round bubble, you know, within the vehicle. Um, and they're, you know, any wreck, you might kaboom. I, that's what know. I always think about. But of course, like if you've ever watched an old 1970s uh, cop show, the, every car that drives off a cliff explodes midair. You know? Well, lately, so. <laughs> it's not cop shows, but several times on the freeway, cars and vans have been on fire. Just very bizarre, like a regular occurrence lately. So I can't imagine... A hydrogen vehicle would probably just blow up, wouldn't it? Well, I don't know. You know, I mean, they've had some studies where they just basically say it just leaks out. You know, it's it's under high pressure, so they get a puncture and it just, you know, goes. But if there was released hydrogen and a combustion source like a spark or a flame, certainly, certainly it's explosive. Uh, it would probably go around like a, like a firework, you know, falling on the ground and you know, spin everything around. So that'd be freaky. I don't think it's very, it's not, I mean, all these technologies are dangerous, but it is dangerous. I well, mean, no it, more than would others. Would you say it's really not very stable? Well, the stability issue that I would have is it's amazingly difficult to produce and it's amazingly difficult to store and it's amazingly <laughs> difficult to transport. Other than that, it's great. I mean, is it, you know? is it inexpensive? No. Okay, no. so it's amazingly expensive. It's amazingly Amazing expensive. Amazing is a word that kind of goes along yeah. with fuel cells. So, so <laughs> if you hold your nose right or your mouth right, you know, and and maybe you can get it to work. But also, these systems are very complicated, complicated and complex. And where so. do you take it to get it worked on if there's something wrong? Um, so it's amazingly difficult to find a place to get it repaired. Probably take it to NASA, right? Do, does it have moving parts? Uh, yeah, well, let's, we'll touch on that in a minute. But let's take just a, a break here to tell you that you're listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke. And we want to remind you once again, it is indeed the end of the world as we know it. And thank God. Thank God. Okay, so where were we? We were, oh, where are we going to take these things yeah. to work on? Uh, that's a problem, but every well, new I technology. Ask you, does it have moving parts? Well, it has a lot of support parts. You know, the fuel cell itself does not. Okay. But you've got to get, you've got to have mechanisms that bring the oxygen and the hydrogen together into the fuel cell. Oh. Then you've got to release the oxygen and the hydrogen. Usually it's released in the form of water vapor. So you have to get that away from everything so it doesn't, you know, rust everything as you're mm -hmm. going. 
Uh, there's platinum involved. Um, they do have metal hydride, which is getting around that transport issue where you basically infuse metal with the hydrogen and then try and remove it from the metal. So they talk about the technology where the whole vehicle could be built out of this metallic hydride and you could remove the, the hydrogen from it so you don't need this explosive tank. That's technology that theoretically would work, but practically... Uh, it's not working. Is um, it? Is that metal a rare metal? Where does it I'm come from? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I could tell you something, but then I'd be a politician just making stuff up. So. Well, that never stopped you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. But um, one of the issues, and of course, when, when scientists talk about this stuff, to me, the big killer is the return on investment, you know, like the energy return on investment. So you could say, for instance, for every kilowatt or BTU or whatever of energy you put in the production of coal, for instance, you typically get about 80 units out. So that's a pretty good return on investment. The investment of energy in digging the coal out of the ground, transporting it, you'll get 80 to one. Um, well, return. that is not true. Well, okay, because no. if you go for the true cost. Okay. Of that well, now you're talking about externalized costs and things like that, but well, I'm just yeah, talking capitalists about capitalists can't be bothered. Yeah. Yeah. That. Can't be bothered. That's a, that's a, that's for that, the next show. That, <laughs> no, it's not because so, you never want to talk about that. Uh, all right. So anyway, so, <laughs> so you're getting a good return, but of course that's because this is stored energy. I mean, you didn't, you didn't right. make it to begin with. Um, oil in 1960 had a 50 to one return. So for every one unit of energy you put in to, extracting oil, you got 50 back. But because oil has been depleted, that's dropped to about 12 to 1. Now in 2007, it's gone even further. So it takes more and more energy to get that energy out of the ground. Biofuels, making fuel from corn, essentially, has a really crappy return. It's like 1.3. So for every one unit of energy going in, you get 1.3. So that's just a whole political thing. It's like yeah, because you know, we got to subsidize. Well, the you got to the the presidential caucuses are in Iowa, so let's Lobbying. let's all support um, fuel. That's right. Um, biofuels. Hydrogen is less than one. So basically, if you put one unit of energy in to creating hydrogen you get less than one unit of energy out. But, so why would, you know, in a capitalist culture, why? Well, I don't, I know the okay. answer to You're why. You're chasing government grant money. That's why. Well, not grant money. <laughs> you're ch not just grant money. You're, you're chasing ch being a charity. Well, and the other issue uh, that's, that's around this and part of the motivation is a lot of these fossil fuel companies see, okay, oil, gas, these are things that are limited in supply. Um, we're moving towards cleaner, you know, battery based vehicles. Well, we can tout out these fossil fuel vehicles as a clean alternative, but we always think, or it's always advertised, you just simply take hydrogen, oxygen, and you end up with water. Clean, clean, green moving machine, fuel cell machine, right? Um, the reality is most of the hydrogen is manufactured by taking natural gas, yeah. which is CH4. That's its chemical compound. Yeah. So there's four parts of hydrogen, one part of carbon. Okay, so when you manufacture hydrogen using natural gas, guess what's given off? Carbon dioxide. Okay, greenhouse gas. So the burning of the hydrogen may be clean, but the producing of the hydrogen is incredibly polluting. So yeah, technology of the future always will be. So I, I, I just don't think that it is a very good alternative. So, so what do these proponents like to claim about this? I mean, what is their what is their dream? And this is this is one of the reasons well, why their dream is to get rich well, not off really. of something crazy. I mean, some of these some of these are sincere geeks, you know? They're sincere geeks who love the idea of of fuel cells. I mean, it, it's it's the guys who grew up reading popular science, popular or having mechanics. Having a little model car that they could set a fuel cell on fire sure. and make it shoot along. We've uh, No, what were those little cell blocks we saw in that show, that British show where the little tractor was they, they Oh, had, no, that was that was steam. 
That was just no, no, regular no. Oh, steam. and it heated up water, yeah. but it was a fuel. Pump yeah, but that, that was they just a solid coal. Yeah, no, the fuel cells um, typically are going to be you simply insert hydrogen. And then they generate. Because they were afraid it was going to blow up. Yeah, well, that's a whole different issue. But the <laughs> but the geek thing uh, is really they envision this thing where where you basically are going to take hyd- oh, take water, separate it into hydrogen and oxygen, use the energy from that, and then the only thing given off is heat and water. Well, in that model, it's it's great. Except it doesn't work that way because it takes more energy to break the bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen in the water than the energy that you get when you use the hydrogen. So it's it's like a it's like a less than one per, one uh, return on your energy investment. The other thing is they see that it's very energy dense. Hydrogen is very energy dense. It has three times as much energy in the same amount of weight as gasoline. So they say, okay, we've got this hydrogen, so it's so energy dense, it's got to work, yeah. you know. Yeah. And and then they think about rapid refueling because one of the kicks on electric vehicles, yeah, they're great, but you got to sit around for six hours waiting for your car to recharge. So they envision that you can just drive up to a hydrogen um, gas tank, you know, stick the thing into your car, fuel it just like you're filling it up with gas, and then away you go. So all these things kind of combine in the minds of the geeks to say, this is going to be great. But you know, it just seems to me, it's more like a competition, like that energy is dense. There's got to be a way we can make it work. So we just keep trying. Sure. Well, that's how. And as long as the government is giving money and maybe even private investors giving money, then hey, free ride, we can keep playing. Well, that's what made America great, right? I mean... Well, that's a whole nother show. <laughs> Government <laughs> subsidies and people willing to externalize yeah, costs. We're living in the age of that for the whole the whole time now. Yeah. So the dream of hydrogen is is what I just said. You know, you can it's clean, it's it's lasts a long time, fuel cells are very robust, and you can fill it up like gas in your car. But in practice, the reality is is very, very different. Um, the reality is apparently it's really hard to fill up your car. You know, you get there, the the things don't work, uh, it, the things won't go in. So it's it's kind of a hit or miss whether you're even going to be able to fill up the car when you get that to the gas station. That would be stressful. Oh, sure, sure. Really stressful. And the range, you know, they, they complain about electric vehicles only have a range of, you know, whatever, however many miles. They call that range anxiety. You know, I if I recharge this, I won't be able to go more than 50 miles or whatever. Although Tesla has gotten, you know, some of his vehicles now are up to 300 miles, about the equivalent right, if of a gas. you have hundred thousand dollars for a car. Okay, you always <laughs> raise these, these, you know, practical issues, practical Dag concerns. So, you know, we're talking technology. Practicality has nothing to do with well, it. Well, okay? and so one of my big problems is that the answer for everything it seems is technology, and I don't see it that way. So that's right. another show too. Okay. okay. All right. Well, we got to go feed the horses. So. <laughs> anyway, so uh, with with fuel cells, with fuel cells, they they literally only have a range about a hundred miles. So all the problems of of um, fueling, and you still have range anxiety. Plus, you know, you can't just go plug in. You know, with an electric vehicle, you can plug in any outlet. Or having a hybrid vehicle yeah. where you where the engine, the gasoline engine, the moving parts kick in and. So you've got backup. That well, only makes sense. And now you're seeing why they've only sold 5,000 of these <laughs> as opposed to, you know, X number of millions of vehicles that are hybrid. I want to know. I don't even want to know who those 5,000 people are because that just strikes me as crazy. Well, and they also talk about how fuel cells are robust. It turns out again, when you're using them at the consumer level, they wear out very quickly. So they don't last. I mean, NASA maybe takes cell, care of them. By fuel cell, you mean the the mechanism that separates or brings yeah. the hydrogen and the oxygen together. Right. The actual fuel cell itself. Uh-huh. They usually call it uh, a proton exchange membrane. Those are the most popular fuel cells, PEMs, proton exchange membranes. And what ends up happening is you have a catalyst and the... Um, hydrogen is separated, or sorry, the electron in the hydrogen is separated from the proton. And then the proton cannot go through the 
mem or sorry, it's backwards. This is like solar cells, but the proton drifts through the membrane, but the electron can't get through. So it has to go, go around, around and that's mm -hmm. your circuit. Yeah. So that's how that works. So it creates a DC current, very similar to a solar panel, uh, only opposite. <laughs> so it's really similar. So it's not similar. It's similar, except it's opposite. The opposite. Okay. Right. right. So they, and, and of course, as we mentioned, hydrogen is very hard to make, very expensive to make, very difficult to store, very difficult to distribute. The systems are very complicated. You said amazingly. Amazingly. Before, amazingly complicated. complicated. Right. Yes. And you can't make your own fuel. Right. Well, that sucks. I mean, like with an electric vehicle. Uh, you, a solar array, hey, you know, now you're getting pretty clean. And and so one of the reasons we'll go back to it is the technology of the future and always will be is that solar and battery technology is evolving so much more rapidly. And all of the advantages that might go to fuel cell have been surpassed by the technology that's being developed at the battery level. So I think it's really the technology that never quite delivers. I think that's a better way to refer to it. Well, there, there may be applications, right? Uh, but really, it was funny. Years ago, I guess 2008, I was researching for a textbook and I was trying to see because fuel cells were the technology that was about ready to be everything. And I was trying to see who was buying fuel cells. And 95% of all the fuel cells sold were to demonstrate how fuel cells work. I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to guess that. And I thought, no, I won't, I won't interrupt you. And the rest of them were military applications, yeah. you know? So, so you've got this, I mean, there may be applications where price is not an issue. Weight is not an issue. Cause again, these things are very heavy. Uh, they're very expensive because platinum is a big part of these things and platinum's not or, cheap. Or there may be applications where boys want to have toys. Well, okay. Okay. <laughs> no, what's so, wrong with that? <laughs> I'm waiting for the downside on that. Everybody everybody wants to play occasionally. They do? I, I don't know. I mean, I think fuel cells. I mean, I played with fuel cells before. They're kind of cool. I mean, it's amazing to just see colorless, odorless hydrogen go in and see electric current being generated. I mean, that lasts about 30 seconds. I was going to say, it's not ever been on my bucket list. Right. Uh huh. Okay. So uh, I think we're coming to a close. Any last second comments on fuel cells? Well, only this quote. After many false starts, hydrogen power might now bear fruit by yeah. The Economist magazine. Yeah. Well, that's how we started out here. We were... Uh, they they just don't give it up, you know. Yeah. So yeah. That's that's what that's what making money is. That's right. All right. Well, you've been listening to when the biomass hits the wind turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke. We want to thank our producer Adam Rich, who is nominated for another Emmy again. Ooh, that guy. I that don't guy. Know. That guy gets Emmys like we eat potato chips. All right. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and we want to thank you for spending just a little bit of time with us. And as your grandmother hopefully told you. The secret to being happy and having a sustainable life is to play nice with others, clean up your own mess, and besides eating your vegetables, I don't know, this world's driving me crazy. All right, with that, take care. Mother Earth will sing and her children will be You can find more information on living sustainably in our unsustainable world at blueRockStation.com.